Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, I'm really excited today for a few reasons. Uh, Firstly, we do have an interview with none other than Michael Connell. Now, Michael is not only the first Australian that I've had on the podcast, uh, but also the first comedian that I've had on the podcast. So very excited that I got to have a chance to uh, uh, speak with him about stoicism because he is influenced by stoicism heavily. Uh, But I want to tell you a little bit about Michael and then uh, we'll jump straight into the interview. So he is a comedian who gets a twisted sense of satisfaction out of making boring topics very funny. Uh, And trust me, you've got to watch some of his stuff on YouTube. All of the links are going to be in the show notes here to where you can go to his YouTube, his website, everything. But you've got to check him out. Uh, He's gotten laughs explaining ancient Greek philosophy, Stoicism. Uh, current attitudes towards poverty and affluence, and futuristic cryptocurrency. So, some career highlights to mention include releasing a Stoic Comedy, a half-hour stand-up special about Stoic philosophy on YouTube, currently at over 25,000 views, uh, being selected to be the World Vision Australia Arts Ambassador, uh, writing the world's first Bitcoin comedy routine that was heavily featured in several documentaries, Uh, and also performing at the now-defunct Albion Comedy Club, where he was so funny that he convinced his now-wife to be his girlfriend. Uh, So, on top of this, Michael has also spoken at Stoicon and is now booked in to speak again this year, 2020, in Toronto at Stoicon. So, you guys who are going to that, you can absolutely look forward to that. But uh, honestly, I had such a great conversation with Michael. He's such a nice guy, uh, hilarious person. As I said, check out all the links. I'll put the links to his uh, Stoic stand-up special in the show notes as well, so you can go straight to that, because it's absolutely hilarious. But uh, without any further ado, I present to you Michael Connell. All right, so Michael, I'm super excited to have you here. Uh, we've just been talking before the show. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I admire uh, your level of stoicism in dealing with my lateness to this interview. <laughs> and uh, um, um, and I'm also very excited to have you on the show because I, I believe you're the first Australian that I've had on the Practical Stoic podcast, and uh, and that that I think that's awesome, and and it's it's great that um, you know there is a there is a thriving little community. It's small, but there's a little community in Australia of Stoics thinking about this sort of stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, it, it sort of surprises me because I always think. The Australian, you know, the stereotypical Australian laid back sort of larrikin sort of attitude is sort of fairly compatible with stoicism. I would have thought there'd be more of us. I don't know. Maybe it was more of a grassroots thing in Australia. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I do see what you mean there, though. Australians do have a very, um, very laid back approach to to life. Although, um, yeah, oh, I'm not too sure how to think about that there are many reasons like what are the particular reasons why you think that stoicism and australians kind of go well together well just you know she'll be right mate could (laughs) perhaps be stoic aphorism couldn't it (laughs) okay for every Um, other person in the world listening to this she'll be right mate is essentially just saying it's okay we'll deal with it like (laughs) like Like everything's okay, right? But it, it's it's yeah, got to have the she be right, mate, kind of yeah. accent. I don't know if Australia is so much that anymore. I mean, yeah. I think increasingly we're very sort of I don't know uptight, sort of entitled might first be world. The word. Sort of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but stereotypically, in the you know, in Australians have this. Uh, for people listening outside of Australia, we have this image of ourselves as. You know, oh, battlers, you yeah. know, doing it hard, facing the elements, pioneer sort of spirit out on the land, you know, droughts, famines, floods, they all hit us. But, you know, they have this she'll be right, mate, sort of yeah. attitude. And 
you know, deal with whatever comes, you know? Yeah. And, and I mean, on, on a very serious note, um, you know, even just recently looking at what's happening with the fires, it's like, um, you know, man, we are a nation built upon the fact that nature is constantly trying to kill us in every way possible, right? We have the deadliest yeah. snakes in the world. We have the most horrific fires, crazy cyclones, floods. You know, at one point, the you know the, the size of like three European countries was like flooded in Australia. You know, like like we 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 really do have like the elements always facing us over here. Um, and so that kind of, I guess you could say that almost fosters a certain, um, a certain understanding of our place in the world, right? Like it kind of shapes us as a country and as people, right? Yeah. It certainly gives you perspective when you could be, you know, washed away in a flood or a bushfire, you know, take yeah. your house or something any moment. Yeah. Yeah. Teach the impermanence of things. Of course. And, uh, so... <laughs> Moving on from the very dark start to our interview, um, but uh, <laughs> no, that was my fault. <laughs> well, like, stoicism and comedy. Tell us why. No. <laughs> but uh, but seriously, like uh, um, guys, if if you haven't already checked it out, check out Michael Connell on YouTube. And um, I've just been, uh, you know, one of the reasons I was late was because I was sitting on the couch eating curry, listening to his his uh, half hour uh, stand up special, you might call it, you know, and uh, and I was loving it i've listened to it a couple of times now and, and i just love how you incorporate stoicism into your comedy but tell us your whole journey how did you get to stoicism how did you get to comedy how did you get to where you are now cool all right um long story so <laughs> comedy i've always i don't know or it's you know maybe it's it's my nature i guess yep. uh, i've always been interested in making people laugh, being mm. funny. When I was a kid, I was very interested in mucking around and performing and I was in a lot of school plays. And for a while, I grew up in the country, so I didn't really know of stand-up as an art mm. form. You know, I, there must it must have been on TV. I must have seen it from time to time, but it, for some yeah. reason, it didn't yeah. click. And living out on a farm, we didn't see any live comedy out where I was. Yeah. Um, so I, I love telling stories. I love making people laugh. Um, in school, I was always in school plays. I've always doing the funny roles. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I want to be an actor. Uh, and then I went to a couple of drama camps. And there were kids who could, like, cry on command. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was like, no, no, that's not me. I just like... I like pretending to be a chicken and, you know, rolling around on the floor. <laughs> this is not what I really want to do. Yeah. So when I was about 15, 14, 15, I was walking down the street and I saw a bunch of people on unicycles and I was like, what's going on? And they're like, oh, there's a local uh, circus school. You can join up at that. So I went and joined that and I learned to juggle and stuff and I thought maybe that's what I wanted to do because I was making people laugh with the juggling. Uh, but then I realized I could just make people laugh without practicing and learning the juggling stuff. So I was like, no, this is what I want to do. Mm. So I was like, maybe it would be like a, you know, if someone asked me, I'd say I'd be a funny storyteller or maybe, do you know, do you know Tony Robinson? Yep. Uh, he's Baldrick from Blackadder. Um, he had like a lot of kids programs where he just talked directly to the camera. I thought that's what I wanted to be. Maybe some, basically I'm describing stand up at this point. And then, and then someone, uh, when I was about 16, 17, my mum took me along to a show in the Melbourne International Comedy Festival called Class Clowns. And I saw a comedian called Dave O'Neill. He was on stage. He did this whole routine about his dad walking around the house in his underpants. And I was like, this is it. This is the thing that I've been trying to, you know, figure out and do. Mm. And just from then on, I just, you know, something clicked. And I wanted to do it for pretty much from then on. Um yeah, so because I was underage, it was very hard to get into stand-up because every, it all happens in, you know, pubs and bars and, you know, licensed venues. Mm. Uh, but I did a few gigs in high school, and then once I got to university and I was old enough to go to bars by myself, I started 
you know, going around doing open mic nights and pretty much stayed at it ever since. Um, mm. Yeah, that's good 20-odd years now. That's awesome. Um, I love it. And 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 so so what I'm interested in is you so you started like comedy first and that was always just something that you were interested in, right? And then yeah, absolutely. so you studied philosophy at university, right? A little, a little, a little bit. So okay, I cool. And in the um specialized I have a philosophy degree. Don't have a philosophy degree. I did uh I did Bachelor of Business in Public Relations, but I was able to do a couple of philosophy units. So I did mm. uh, some philosophy mm. units as part of that degree. It's just easier to say it, <laughs> yeah. you know, in a joke, you have to keep it short. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then was listening to a lot of philosophy podcasts, um, reading a lot of philosophy books, um, you know, also a lot of CBT stuff. Just, I don't know. Um, Comedy is a lot about the mind and about the audience and understanding human nature. And increasingly, yeah, I've been interested in philosophy and psychology. And yeah, I think it was probably Tim Ferriss who got me onto Stoicism. But from there, I read uh, William Irvine's book and. Uh, Donald Robertson's book and, you know, watch Greg Sadler's stuff online and, yeah, just been listening to a lot of podcasts and watching YouTube videos and heaps of stuff ever since. Hmm. Uh, yeah, so we I, actually share the same origin story in Tim Ferriss. Uh, you oh, know, right. I, I originally came to Stoicism because he said that his favorite book was Letters from a Stoic, right? And so I was like, okay, well, if Tim Ferriss recommends it, it's probably a pretty good recommendation. So I read it. It's like, damn, this is good stuff, right? And so, um, yeah. So, how how did you how did you essentially? So you so you read Stoics, and what 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 like what drew you to it? Like, what when you started reading it, what 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 about it really clicked with you? It's just a very logical sort of philosophy. As a as a teenager, I was kind of interested in Buddhism. I liked the the Buddhist philosophy of uh, sort of, you know, a lot of the overlap of with Stoicism that you have, you know, impermanence of all things, um, you know, it's not what actually happens, it's our perceptions of what happens that affect us. Um, but Buddhism has this other layer to it, that I find is sort of the mysticism in there as well. Certainly Zen, I couldn't get in too down. I listen to a lot of Alan Watts and kind of like some of it, but then a lot of it's very, gets a bit woo-woo at points, and then he'd lose me. So I was kind of like, mm, I kind of like this. And then Stoicism kind of like ticked all the boxes for me. So it was logical. It, you know, made sense. It was practical. The things I could use in my everyday life. Um, yeah, I was just reading these books and thinking this is this is exactly what I sort of already sort of feel and in my you know I don't always apply it sometimes emotions get the better of me but when afterwards you know when I've had a bit of an emotional outburst I'll sit down and think was that the right thing to do is that the right way how should I handle this and usually I would have eventually through trial and error um, come to a fairly stoic sort of response and it was just mm. amazing to see these ideas written down in books from you know thousands of years ago mm. yeah no it really is amazing and i think you can really test um test ideas by their longevity right it's like people are still talking about this philosophy and still very interested in in how it can be helpful for us even though it's thousands of years old um and it's and not only that, but it's it's so practical in in so many different areas of life, and and it's so wide spanning, um, even to the point where it can be you know here's a cheesy segue, but it can be helpful for comedy. You know, it's like so, like I, I really wanted I wanted to talk to you about about that because you know I've spent a lot of time with comedians. I I, I did a few cruise contracts as a musician, and so I was right next in my jazz club on the ship. I was right next to the comedy club, and. Uh, talked right. to comedians pretty much every single night and came to just 
adore comedians, right? Because they have this really, this really dark humor amongst them. Uh, this really weird way of looking at life. It's like they're they're literally successful. They're on a ship, you know, like they're they're making a ton of money, uh, making people laugh, doing what they love, and still they think that everything is horrible. And I was like, I just don't get, <laughs> I don't get this. It's <laughs> like they're such cool people, and and I really uh, enjoyed spending time with them. And so, uh, what I find interesting about your comedy is it's it's very much focused around the idea that everybody thinks that you should be one way that you should hate life because it, like that, that the whole like struggling comedian sort of thing. Right. But you're actually very happy and content with life because of stoicism. Right. So how did you get to that point with stoicism or have you always been naturally kind of inclined to just be happy with your lot in life? I think probably like you're saying comedy is a very tough industry. Yeah. And it's not so much a job as a lifestyle sometimes. Mm. And living that life, certainly you have to come up with like, or at least I did, had to come up with like mental strategies, way to see things and perceive things and deal with whatever comes your way. And I think stoicism is ideal for that. Um, and I think a lot of just the hardships of the comedy industry itself sort of builds into comedians, this sort of natural sort of stoicism. Um, after you've been doing, when you start out, you know, you're, you get excited about, Oh, you get this great gig. Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, you get a very tough gig oh you're devastated then you have to realize you have to learn to separate yourself you go look there's me and then there's what happens and i can be good and i can perform and i can be happy with myself and content in my practice of the art um regardless of what happens because if you're constantly buffeted by the ups and downs of the comedy industry you just won't survive um yeah, and I think in developing the show, it was interesting because a lot of comedy is about sort of whinging and complaining and being unhappy. And I tr had to try and look at how to write the show to go, yes these sort of situations aren't ideal and that's where the comedy comes from because comedy people always say this comedy is uh tragedy plus time you know hmm. um so it's getting that tragedy in there but also at the same time bringing it back and going ah but you know because of the way i look at things because of the philosophy that i'm practicing things are all right hmm. on the inside yeah, definitely. And, and I really liked that. I really enjoyed it. And and not only that, but it was really like, it was also informative, you know, for somebody who has, who, who might have never heard of stoicism or, or thought about philosophy in this way. Um, you did a, like an amazing job of, of making it really enjoyable and fun to listen to these very deep philosophical ideas, you know, and, and, and it's, um, it's, it's really great to see, uh, you know, people actually, trying to incorporate really complex ideas, which I think a lot of comedians do, obviously. Like, talk, like that, that's one of the beauty of comedy. It's like encapsulating the most complex ideas of society into something that it's almost like smuggling philosophy into your life without you even knowing it, you know? Um, and, and I really appreciate that. And, and one thing that you said in there, which uh, I actually helped me to understand the philosophy a little bit better, was you were talking about... Uh, essentially like emotions and, and our thoughts and our thoughts are the one thing that we can really control. Right. But then you said, well, you know, not all thoughts, like you can, sometimes you get a thought, but our true ability is not necessarily to control whether that comes up or not. It's our ability to essentially say whether you agree with it or not. Right. And that kind of leads to what you see essentially. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that side of like philosophy and, or stoicism and how that has kind of helped you, uh, whether it's been with, you know, anxiety or, or, or like the stress of your current career and everything like that. And, and 
as a performer, I know like getting up on stage in front of people and trying to please them, it's like one of the hardest things in the world because you just don't know, right? You just don't know what's going to happen. But how does that ability to question your thoughts influence the way that you live your life? Well, sometimes comedy comedy is a very fragile thing. It's sort of an illusion. It mm. looks it looks like you're just standing on stage and talking and you kind of are, but there's a lot more that goes into it as well. Like, you know, lighting and sound, you know, getting people's attention, having the right material. Sometimes you come up, you come to gigs, they've hired a comedian and they, people don't understand this. And they, you know, they've got a band on at the same time, or, you know, they're going to serve meals while the comedy happens. And then and you try to tell them, they won't listen, so you have to go out and you have to do your job. And so then you're on stage talking to these people who have a mouthful of food and are not listening because the band's playing and they're seated facing away from you. Um, and, you know, it is, it is devastating, or it can be devastating, hmm. throwing, you know, this material that you've worked, you know, for months on years yep. even out at this audience that just doesn't care and then you when when things don't go well in a play you can go oh well you know they didn't enjoy the play the script wasn't very good or you know one of the other characters he flubbed his lines you know he ruined the show when people don't like comedy they don't like you and it's very yep. hard yeah. not to take personally so that's the ideas that start coming through your head you just it's just this tidal wave of, you know, oh, you're terrible. What are you doing? You're an idiot. People think you're stupid. Everyone hates you. And these ideas will come in, but you can, that's the power of, that we have is that we can go, no, I'm not going to agree with that idea. I'm not going to accept that idea. You can counter those ideas. You go, look, you know, it wasn't my fault audiences weren't working, you know, they weren't, the show wasn't set up correctly, mm. no one could do it, or you could go, look, I couldn't win them over tonight, but another mm. time I will. And then you also have the flip side, if you do a show and everything goes great and you absolutely kill it, you can feel like, I'm the greatest in the world, I'm the best, <laughs> and then you can be, you know, conceited and it goes to your head, uh, and that can be bad too, because then you get on stage the next performance and then you're really cocky and you've got these arrogant sort of flavor to all your jokes and people hate that as well audiences mm. really don't like that if you do it too much so it's, again if things are going well you can go well they really enjoyed it but you know it's important to keep working hard they're not just loving me they're loving mm. all the hard work i've put in you know um it's not just winning one show, it's winning most of the shows that's important. Just mm. keeping that even feel. And, and I think uh, what's, what's really interesting about, about uh, comedy as well is like you could, you might be able to speak to this, you could do the exact same show twice in one night and one audience would just be totally on board and the other audience would be just so dead and i've seen this happen time and time when i was on the ship and i would be in the comedy club just watching you know i'd watch these comedians get up there and do the exact <laughs> same show and yeah. one audience is just on fire and the next audience because there's a higher population of elderly retirees who don't understand what they're talking about it's just like just, just doesn't happen it bombs and and like it it can be really uh like disheartening right like when like like can you speak to how it feels like when you're on stage with those high stakes and it's not going well when when comedy goes well it is the greatest feeling in the world yeah. when it goes bad though it is the worst feeling in the world because it is all on you um again practicing stoicism you know has helped me deal and also i'm a lot better at performing now so i bomb a lot less yeah. still happens yeah. like you say sometimes 
you know, you get out on stage and just things are not right and you, you're going to die. And, but, you know, I'm a lot more, a lot more experienced now. And when things are going bad now, I can sort of have more perspective on it, have, just, you know, take a higher view of the situation mm. or I can go, look, you know, it's not my fault or whatever. Just change my perspective. I, sometimes you can even find the funny in it. You can go, oh, man, this is going bad. And then you can go, oh, could it get even worse? How mm. is this happening? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. At first, when I started comedy, because um, you... you when you start out, you, you're still very unsure. You're like, am I funny? Can I make people laugh? Mm. Will this work? And when you die, it is, it, it can be soul destroying. And I, I remember sometimes I did a few gigs and they just didn't like my, didn't like my stuff. And I'd go out in the car and have a bit of a cry and be shaking my head. Like, what am I doing? Why am mm. I, why am I doing this? Um, but as you go along, you do more and more, you know, tougher and tougher gigs. And they, they build that, you know, uh, resilience. Um, mm. You know, Seth talks about, you know, sleeping on the floor, you know, and a couple of days a week, dress, you know, in your worst clothes and eat, you know, really rough food. Comedians sort of have a similar thing. We're all like, when you're starting out, go out and do <laughs> the rough gigs, do the yeah. worst room. And just to build that, build that hide right yeah so then after a while you're just like yeah yeah you know <laughs> uh when i when i started those gigs the, I, I think about the gigs that made me cry in the first year i was doing it and they were they were bad gigs they were just like you know uninterested you know audience members mm. who just couldn't care less about what i was talking about after, uh, you know, a couple of years later, I'd be doing gigs where, like, I don't know. I remember emceeing a Battle of the Bands competition, and every band was like a heavy metal, um, you know, thrash metal outfit. And their audience just hated my jokes about puppies and visiting <laughs> my... And they started throwing bottles at me. <laughs> and just... And that one, because, you know, I'd been, at that point, I was like four or five years into doing stand-up. You know, water off the duck's back then. Yeah. You know, it was yeah. fine. Because you're like, ah, you know, I've, ex I've experienced worse. You know, this is not the worst thing in the world. You uh -huh. know, don't like me, but that's, you know, not going to kill me. People cannot like me. It's going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Well, you could make an argument that you haven't truly lived until you've had bottles thrown at you by thrash metal fans because you've done a puppy <laughs> joke, right? Like, uh, of course, that's 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 life. Um, and I, yeah. you, and like, at the time, at the time, it's brutal. But yeah, after a while, it's sort of it's sort of funny, and it's yeah, it's it has fascinating stories. I comedians have this one thing that comedians are great at is going, oh. This will be material. Like yeah. whenever something terrible yeah. is happening in their life, you know, their car explodes, you know, their planes delayed by 16 hours and, mm. you know, something goes wrong. They're like, this, this will be material. This will be in next year's show. We're always yeah. sort of going, ah, yeah, ah, yeah we can uh, just observe things, use this, don't get too up. Look for the funny in this tragedy because in like a couple of, couple of days couple of weeks whatever in the future this is going to be comedy gold yeah and i, th I think that's actually uh one reason why why comedians have a bit of a, a closer connection with a philosophy like stoicism because it teaches us that um to look at life as if it's essentially happening for you like what can you get out of it as opposed to it's happening to you right so um even seneca said something along the lines of i'm paraphrasing here he said um, you know, it, it shows a better character to laugh at life than to bemoan it, right? Because that's it's the lighter side of life and it allows you to get through it because it is a tragedy that we're all living here. Crap things happen all the time. And what's beautiful about comedy is they turn those crap things that happen into something that is absolutely beautiful that we can all laugh at. 
And I agree with you. That, oh my gosh, comedians, when you sit down and you talk with them, they have the best stories about the worst gigs that they've... Like, you just hear the <laughs> crappest stories and you think, I could... But the thing is, they're always laughing about it, right? In, in the moment, they would have been hating life, but they're always laughing about it. So I'm going to save this question for the end, but I need you to think about like the worst gig that you've ever done because I really want to talk about that because <laughs> I know it's probably going to be a, a good story. But I wanted to ask you um, how you approach goal setting through a stoic lens and also in your career as a comedian because... I feel like uh, any sort of creative uh, career, the, the stakes are so high and it's such a difficult place to, to navigate that goal setting is like, it's actually really difficult because there's so much that is outside of your control, right? So how do you even set goals or do you even set goals and how do you approach it? I, I do set goals to a degree. I... W- I sort of go, I would like to do this, I would like to do that, but I'm always like, these are preferred indifference, right? I would Mm. prefer, you know, I would prefer to be super famous, I would prefer to be a multi-millionaire touring Mm. comedian, but, you know, it's an indifferent, because if it doesn't happen, I'll be fine without it. Mm. I think, well, increasingly, um, I'm taking an approach of just that idea of arate, you know, the practice of the pursuit of excellence, just trying to be the best performer I can be. And then, because that is within my control. And Mm. then whatever happens from there happens, you know? Um, So yeah, just really focusing on making the performance the best it can be, developing material, trying to have a practice of it's it's a bit hard now i've just had a baby um i've got a nine month old girl she's very busy um but uh yeah just trying as much as i can to have a practice of writing material working on stuff whenever i perform listening back constant improvement um because you know yeah there are so much in the performing arts world is beyond your control um, but your, your skills are always within your control. So I feel mm. that is the best idea to focus on and then just, yeah, leave the rest up to fortune. Um, mm. I always, it's tough for a comedian, but I always feel it's even tougher for like actors or musicians, you know, like for me, I can... I'm just a solo performer. I can write a routine. I can go out to an open mic and I can get on stage and test it out. Mm. Even if, if a comedy club doesn't book me, I can, I don't know, hire out a, a hall or put on a show at the local pub or something. You know, do invite friends around to the lounge room and tell some jokes to them. Um, yeah, I always think it must be much harder for actors whose you know, profession is almost entirely out of their control. But maybe, I don't know. Maybe no, got <laughs> I think you're being too easy on yourself and, and, and comedy. <laughs> okay, okay, take it from some... Okay, I I tried comedy once on the ship, right? I got up there and I was like, sweet. So the, the comedy host, he said, give it a go. So I was like, okay, cool. I put some material together and it was absolutely hilarious how I stood up there for probably about five minutes and the comedians who were on the ship, they were standing off the back and they were just watching me just die. You know, I started with like a couple of good laughs and then it just trailed off until I was just saying absolute nonsense. I think I went up there with a martini glass singing the love boat theme, something like that. <laughs> and uh, and by the time I got down, the comedians were just in hysterics. And I was like, what do you think? And they were just like, we can't believe you stayed up there that long. <laughs> like, we, we can't believe that you you actually dealt with how crap that was like, for so long. And, and it's so difficult. It's so hard to get up there and put all of your emotions aside and just focus purely on trying to get a laugh out of people, which if you're around your friends, it's like 
easy, right? You can you can just talk crap, you can just have a good time, and everybody's laughing, having a good time. But as soon as the stakes are so high that like, oh, uh, people expect you to make them laugh, it's horrifying. The, that might be another thing where stoicism comes in. Again, this is you know the what's in your control, what's out of your control. Mm. Um, if you are trying to make the, it's strange. If you're trying to make the audience laugh, that's obviously beyond your control because it's up mm. to the audience whether it's funny or not. Yeah. So when I get yeah. on stage, I don't try to make the audience laugh. Mm. I try to express myself, the feelings I have on a certain topic, and usually laughter is a byproduct of that and then i work really hard to edit and write it's not so much writing as the rewriting in comedy so i rewrite things as much as possible edit 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 whittle mm-hmm. it down to mm-hmm. have the funniest stuff possible um and that's the area that i can control rather than the audience laughing because you see this a lot with beginners and i certainly did it a lot when i started is you're like Okay, I got to make the audience laugh. How do I mm. get strangers to laugh at what I'm saying? And then you come off really corny, or you're tr- desperate, or and, and audiences hate that. So I think, yeah, the trick is just go, hey, I'm going to express myself, and I know I make my friends laugh when I'm out there. Because when you make your friends laugh, you're not going in there like, oh, here's some killer material yeah. you're like hey this thing happened to me or i had this terrible experience at the airport or whatever and you just say it and they start laughing at you because you know you're a funny person um so yeah i think i think that's the trick to start to using this sort of yeah stoic but- slash jet mind trick approach <laughs> to stand up yeah, it, it, it's 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 almost like don't try to be anything that you're not. Like just yeah. try to be exactly what you are. And it reminds me of a story that um that Joe Rogan told which was so insightful. It was I think it was Mitzi Shaw uh and um and some comedian came up to her and he he said just I'm, you know I'm I'm trying to find my voice. And she just looked at him and said, "What's the matter? You lost it?" Like <laughs> as if like like what do you mean? Like you just you just get up there and you try to be exactly who you are and if you're a funny person then people will laugh at that and if you're not then they won't, you know, but but you try as best as you can, right? Um yeah, that's that's I think that's a really good approach, right? Um absolutely. I think this is again why as a kid I thought being an actor, but I think it's qu- it's quite a different skill. I'm not an actor. Mm-hmm. Um I've actually been in a couple of commercials and my wife has seen these commercials on YouTube. She's like, you are very much not an actor. (laughs) Can we see these commercials on YouTube? (laughs) Yes, you can. If you can look them up there. Um, I think they're still on YouTube. I think one's out there. Um, but yeah, uh, (laughs) I think comedy is very much, like it's all about becoming yourself to be as mm. true to yourself mm. as possible on stage and not, you know, it's, it's hard because you're in front of an audience, you know, you're the spotlights on you. You've got this instinct to put on this character or think who should I be or what should I be? Mm. You're getting rid of all that and becoming yourself as much as possible. Whereas with acting, you're like, oh, I'm getting rid of myself and putting on the, the character. You know, what would, you know, what would Oliver Twist act like? How would, you know, Willy Wonka walk? You know, how would he talk? Mm. That sort of, you know. Yeah, and and, yeah, you know, I think I think what really draws me towards, uh, what am I trying to say? Creative people such as comedians, you know, apart from the fact that I am a musician, you know, musicians, comedians, actors, you know, any sort of creative pursuit. What's really interesting is about the Stoics talk about we need to align with nature, right? One of the meanings of that is align with your nature as a human being. Where do you fit into society, right? 
And it's like, nobody ever becomes a musician because they think that it's going to be easy for them to create a career out of it. <laughs> like, like, like if, and if they do, they're completely naive, right? People go into music or comedy or, or anything almost because they can't do anything else. It's like, like, like it's so inbuilt to them as human beings it, to be creative, right? Just that's their nature, right? Did you feel that when you were younger, like that it was just so a part of you that this had to be something that you did? Absolutely. Absolutely. I always want to do, you know, like a, a telling stories, telling jokes to the other kids in class, getting up and doing funny skits for people. I was like, this is something that I'm really interested in. And when I started in comedy, I did the, I did a very rookie thing of going, oh, like, like the story you mentioned before with Joe Rogan, um, you know, what's my voice? What's my mm. character? Who am I? And I read a lot of, there's a lot of terrible books on how to become a comedian, you know, joke writing 101 sort of books. And I read all those books because I thought that's what you did. And all the books said, you know, develop a character, become a, you know, what's your persona, you know, all that sort of thing. And just left me super confused. And I was on stage trying to be, trying to be a comedian, trying to be my idea of what mm. a comedian was. And it was terrible because because audiences knew that it wasn't real. It was fake. It was this facade I was putting on. They didn't know who I was, the real me. It wasn't until I gave up on that and just threw it away and started just trying to be myself on stage that I started getting laughs. Hmm. And I absolutely I think, yeah, uh, certainly in comedy – I mean, I know that it's not with every, not at all comedians take this approach. I mean, there's guys like Stephen Wright, you know, they're one-liners. They've got these, or, you know, um, Emo Phillips, they've got these weird characters, you know, they're one-liner guys, or Ali G, or I suppose he's not a stand-up. But, you know, that, they have it a character or they work it out. They're very ridiculous mm. jokesmiths. But I think... A lot of comedians, I would even go as far as say most comedians, what makes them great is when you're seeing them on stage and they're, you're getting a, you know who they are. You can see their nature coming out through their material. It's not so much the material. It's not what they're saying. It's, it's who they're being. It's mm. what they're projecting through this material. Yeah. And, and, and that's a, that's almost one of the reasons why you know you see a lot of comedians start out and they they dress in crappy clothes and you know they just get up there as who they are and they're having fun and they're really awesome and then as their career progresses and they get better you see them starting to wear suits and then you know they get a little bit fancy and then and then it's almost as if okay where's the magic it's kind of it's kind of we're losing the magic because you're moving away from like exactly who you were right like and 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 I've 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 seen you know a lot of that where it, where it's kind of like this yeah they move in a direction of what they think they are now and and then you go back to their older stuff and it's like wow this is just so authentic this is just a kid trying to make it in comedy and it's no different to how you would expect them to act around their friends or anything like that right um, but I think I think it's time to hear this story <laughs> I, I'm, I'm really excited for this cool there is and i know there's a, a lot there's of pressure lot. here i'm very sorry for, to put all this pressure on you but i i know that you've probably got a great story for us yeah i'm like how do i pick one um <laughs> I, I think my personal favorite gig was i got asked to do a fundraiser for um the firefighters, the CFA, mm -hmm. uh, local mm -hmm. CFA group, and great guys. I love them. I, they do great stuff. I was very happy to help. Um, they do great work saving people from bushfires. They do not run the best shows. So I got invited to this event, 
and it was out near where my parents live, out where I grew up in the country. So I drove out there and kept driving, kept driving, kept driving. I eventually get there, and I thought it was going to be like the fire station. I thought it was going to be in the hall. Turns out it's out in a paddock. <laughs> They've uh, pulled up uh, a truck, and we're going to be performing on like the the trailer on the back of this <laughs> semi trailer. Um, fine, I can I can give that a go. If this so is fine. Band- I can't imagine where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, they've got bands. I'm going to be coming on in between the bands. We're going to MC the show, apparently. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. I can do that. And this is all they're, they're telling me all this before the show starts. And then they've built a big bonfire. Um, it's in the paddock, kind of off to the side of the stage. And just before the show starts, they light the bonfire up. This bonfire is huge. This bonfire is like two stories high. So there's this towering inferno of, you know, wood and, and, you know, old packing crates and stuff. Just just tower of flames (laughs) going up. And I'm on stage on this back of this truck going through the PA system. And as soon as the fire lights up, everyone goes, oh, that's too hot. So the audience moves back. I see the, where this is going. Yeah. The paddock. So I'm like three paddocks back from them with this bonfire in the middle in between me and the audience. And I'm like, this, this, this can't get any worse. This can't You'd get think worse. that and the fireys would know where to put the fire, right? Like. So- You'd think that the fireys would know where to put the fire. In, in, in <laughs> they they were under control. They were very good. Um, but then the wind changed, <laughs> and I was performing while sparks and bits of ash were falling down onto the stage. So um, that was that was a fun gig. That was very <laughs> memorable. <laughs> I'm not just disappointed. Sort of jokes, coughing through the smoke, dying of smoking inhalation. Ah, oh, oh, quality times. That that's great. Okay, well, every time we have an interview on this show, I'm gonna have to get another story from you because I'm sure you have heaps. But that was that was awesome. Yeah, that that Absolutely. encapsulates. Like, sorry, go on. No, anytime. I'll. I've got a. I've got a lot of them. Yeah. No, I love it. And um, yeah, I just, I really appreciate you coming on today and, and, and sharing your whole experience. Cause I, you know, as I said, I think, I think what um, the, the career that you're in is such a perfect representation of, of the, the challenges that we deal with and the way that you can use stoicism to overcome them, right? Like you're living in a, in a high stakes, high reward kind of game, right? It's like, you're either going to get up there and it's going to go really well or it's going to go really badly and you you have to control what you can control in order to make that happen. And on top of that, navigating the creative world and trying to make a career out of that, which you've obviously done, you know, it, it's it's inspiring to others and it, it's it's really, um, I, I guess it's, it's good to see how philosophy can be used so practically. And uh, I just want to encourage everybody to watch your, you know, your special. It's awesome. I'm going to include a link in the show notes to everything that, where people can find you. But is there anything you want to share with the audience before we go? No, I, I think you've covered it all. Please watch the special, like and subscribe. Really appreciate yeah. those subs. Thanks for, thanks for having me on the podcast. No worries. Uh, the, the first Aussie interview on the podcast. I'm very excited and, um, <laughs> and we'll have well, many more. There'll be more. There's uh, there's a Stoa in Melbourne and the yeah. Brisbane Stoics. They've got a Stoic meetup group. It's happening. Yeah, I love it. Stoicism taking Australia by storm. So uh, <laughs> awesome. Well, I'll talk to you next time. Talk to you next time. Thanks so much. 
All right, so there you have it, my conversation with Michael Connell. And uh, guys, as I said, I'm going to put all of the links to where you can find Michael in the show notes. Make sure you head over there, check him out, show him some love and support, and uh, and reach out and let him know how much you appreciated this conversation because we want to have him back on the show time and time again. Uh, but uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everybody, thank you so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J. E. Drew. See you next time.